Hi, this is Chaplain Garrett. Greg, welcome back to the Wandering Wesleyan and our Walking in the Word series. And uh, today we're going to finish up the Torah. We've gone through Genesis, long time in Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, and uh, today we're going to go through Numbers and Deuteronomy, which seems like we're going fast, and guess what? Yeah, we are. Um, but remember, this whole series is about looking at the narrative, the, the stream of narrative through the Bible so that we can see this continuous story of God and his people and salvation and how our first parents uh, kind of mess stuff up and how God reclaims and brings his people back to him. So we're going to continue with the book of Numbers and like we've said many times before, Numbers is not a, uh, not a Hebrew name. It's not even a Greek name. It's an English name. But um, Numbers has to do with the name uh, Brindamore, or Bemidbar. It's hard to pronounce some of these things, huh? Bemidbar. And what does that mean? Well, it means in the desert. So if we look at Numbers 1-1 one, one here, the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in where? The wilderness, in Sinai. Now notice something. Where did we leave Exodus? Moses couldn't go in the tent. Where do we start Numbers? The Lord spoke to Moses. Where? In the tent of meeting. Where? In the wilderness. This book is aptly named because not only are they in the actual wilderness, in the desert, in this arid uh, desert-like place, but they're also in a spiritual wilderness as well, and we'll see that. Uh, Numbers is a very dark book. There's a lot of things that happen in here that are unsettling. Uh, Moses can now enter the tent, but the book has a whole bunch of censuses, and that's why it's called Numbers, uh, counting the people, but also these dark stories. Um, things are not going to go well for Israel while they are in the wilderness. So chapters 1 through 10, Israel is counted. And God also gives instructions on how the camp is to move. Now, watch this. When they settle down and they camp for a period of time, the tent of meeting is in the middle. All right? So the tabernacle is in the middle of all the tribes. They're to have three tribes on the western end. They're to have three tribes on the eastern end. They're to have three tribes on the southern end. And then three tribes on the northern end. With God in the middle. Accident. Nothing's an accident with God. Does it refer to the cross? Uh, I'd like to think so. I think it's kind of cool, don't you? So the tent in the middle, three to the west, three to the east, three to the north, three to the south. Chapters 11 through 12, the people complain about manna. They're getting food from God and they're complaining about it. Also, we have our first rebellion, Aaron. Moses' brother and his sister Miriam both rebel. This is the first hint that things are not going to go well in the wilderness. Chapters 13 through 14 are very important for what happens next because spies are sent to the promised land. So they get to the edge of the promised land and they decide to send 12 spies into the promised land to say, okay, is this all God said it was going to be? They come back and they affirm that, yes, it is all that God said it was going to be. However, 10 of them said that there's no way Israel can defeat the people there. And you know what? They're right. There's no way Israel by themselves can defeat these people. They're very powerful. Got military... Israel is not a military juggernaut at this point, by any stretch. But with God, 
God parted the Red Sea and destroyed the greatest uh, military and political power in the world. They can go in and take care of these. He can go in and take care of these Canaanites. But these ten said, no, we can't do it. But two of them, Caleb and Joshua, affirm that the people look tough, but their God is tougher. And in the end, they believe the ten who said don't go. So what does God do? He puts a pronouncement on Israel that the entire generation, everybody 20 years old and older, except for Moses, Caleb, and Joshua, everybody 20 years old and older is going to die in the wilderness over 40 years. And the next generation will be able to enter in. Chapters 16 through 17, we have another rebellion. A guy named Korah and his family rebels. Doesn't end well for them. Chapters 18 through 19, we get a few more instructions for the priests. Chapter 20, Israel is complaining again. God tells Moses this time, and it's over water. And God tells Moses, go speak to the rock. But Moses is just so fed up and furious with the people. He takes the staff and he strikes the rock. He doesn't speak to the rock like God told him. But he strikes the rock. Water still came out. God still provides even though we sin. Moses sinned. And Moses is then, at that point, for, forbidden from entering the promised land. Now, in our 21st century Western sensibilities, we can say, what's the big deal? He's still got water, right? That's not the point. The point is, Moses is the prophet of God. He speaks for God. He's, hold, he's held to a much, much higher standard than any other person. And when God tells him to do something, he better do it. And when God tells him to speak to the rock, he should have spoke to the rock. But instead, he did it his own way. Go back to the garden. They wanted to do it their own way. He wanted to do it. Moses wanted to do it his own way. So now he's forbidden from entering the promised land. Like I said, In the Wilderness is a very dark book. Chapter 21. The people rebel again. Go figure. God sends poisonous snakes into the camp. But he also provides a way out by putting this bronze serpent on a stick and everybody looks up to it. will be healed. But again, the people rebel. They're judged. And God provides a way out. Chapters 20 through through 25. This is a very odd story of this guy named Balaam. And he's asked by the king of Moab, keep that, keep that nation in your mind, Moab. They're going to show up in the book after the Torah. Uh, Moab wants to curse Israel. Now remember the promise that God gave Abraham. Everyone who blesses you will be blessed. Everybody who curses you will be cursed. So Balaam is this kind of priest guy, and he's sort of, I don't know, a, a mercenary priest. He'll be a priest for whatever God is going to get him money at the time. So he is hired by the king of Moab and a few others to go out and curse Israel. So Balaam ends up not being able to do it. He can't. He can't curse Israel. And as you read through the story, there's talking donkeys. And I always thought that even though it was a female donkey, I thought the donkey always sounded a little bit like Gilbert Gottfried for some reason. I don't know why. Anyway, the point of the story is that even though Israel's continued rebellion and sin, God still loves them, is still preserving them, and has a plan for salvation that's going to work through them. This whole story, chapter 22 through 25, Balaam and the cursing of Israel, happens without their knowledge. Chapter 26, 
the focus changes now to the next generation of Israelites. The prior generation has died in the wilderness and now the new generation is ready to move in to the promised land. So what do they do? They take a census. Chapters 27 through 36, a number of battles are won and the tribes are preparing to enter the promised land. So Numbers is a tough book. It's a tough book to read, but you know what? It's worth it. It's worth going through the hard stuff in order to get to what God wants us to see. So our next book is going to be Deuteronomy. Now, Deuteronomy is Greek for the second law. However, in Hebrew, the name is Devarim, Devarim, or the words. And it comes from Deuteronomy 1.1. 1, 1. These are the words Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness. So they're on the other side of the Jordan. They're waiting to go west into the promised land. And Moses is going to give a series of speeches. So Deuteronomy is composed of three speeches or the last sermons of Moses. Chapters 1 through 11 is the opening sermon. So chapters 1 through 3 is a summation of how Israel has been repeatedly disobedient and how God has repeatedly been gracious. This is something that comes up over and over again. You're going to disobey, but God will be gracious. Chapter, chapters 4 through 11 is a call to covenant faithfulness. Chapter 4, a call to remember the covenant. Chapter 5, a repeat of the Ten Commandments. And then we get to chapter 6. And chapter 6 is probably the most important chapter in the entirety of the Torah. Why is that? Let's start reading in verse 1. This is the command, the statutes, and the ordinance the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you. Now this is Moses speaking. So that you may follow them in the land as you enter and possess. Do this so that you may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life by keeping all his statutes and commands I am giving you, your son, as your grandson, and so on, so that you may have a long life. Listen, Israel, and be careful. Listen is a, listen Israel in Hebrew, Shema Israel, Shema Israel, and be careful to follow them so that you may prosper and multiply greatly because the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the important part. Shema Israel, Adonai, Yahweh, Adonai, Echad. Listen Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It is a call to absolute devotion to God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words I am giving you today are to be your, in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Achad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And we are to love God, Yahweh, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yahweh is the one, the only true God, and the predominant value of Hebrew and Christian faith is based on this. Listen means to hear and also means to respond. That is obedience. Love, bring our emotions and our decisions. What is that? Devotion. The Lord is one. The Lord is alone. There are no other gods. Now there's another important passage that I want to review with you, and that's in chapter 10. So turn with me 
to chapter 10. And we're going to go to verse 12. And this is what God requires. And this is verse 12 through 22. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? Except to fear the Lord. And what do we mean by fear the Lord? Do we mean be scared? Ah! No. It means to have reverence, respect, to place God above all of the other things. Fear the Lord, your God, by walking in all his ways. To love him and to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Keep the Lord's commands and statutes. I am giving you today for your own good. The heavens, indeed the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as does the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord had his heart set on your ancestors and loved them. He chose their descendants after them. He chose you, he chose you, out of all the peoples as it is today. Israel, you are our chosen nation. You are going to be the vehicle that I'm going to use to save the world. Therefore, circumcise your hearts. It isn't just a physical circumcision. It's a spiritual change. And don't be stiff-necked any longer. For the Lord your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great and mighty and awe-inspiring God, showing no partiality, taking no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, loves the resident alien. He loves illegal aliens. He loves the people who are foreigners, giving them food and clothing. You are also to love the resident aliens since you were once resident aliens in the land of Egypt. You are to fear the Lord your God. You are to worship him, remain faithful to him, and take oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you all these great awe-inspiring works your eyes have seen. Your ancestors went down to Egypt, 70 people in all, and now the Lord has made you numerous like the stars of the sky. Oh my goodness. This is the story we've been through. That God has carried this people, this ragtag, rebellious, stubborn people. But they're still loved by him and they're still going to be used as his vehicle for saving the world. Now, chapters 12 through 26 is kind of a retelling of the law. 12 through the beginning of 16 is Israel's worship. Uh, the rest of 16 through 18 is all about Israel's leaders. Now, here's, here's an important part. 17, 14 through 20, and I'm not going to read that, but I, I encourage you. Chapter 17, verses 14 through 20 are specific instructions to how kings are supposed to act. Israel doesn't have a king. God is saying, I'm your king, but you know what? Someday you're going to rebel and you're going to want your own king. And these, this is how they're supposed to act. None of them did, by the way. Not even David. We'll get to that. Chapters 19 through 26. These are laws and social, about social justice, civil laws and social justice. And then chapters 27 through 34. This is Moses' final sermon before his death. And um, there's, there's a few things in here that are, that are interesting, but what I really want to point out is in chapter 32, verses 1 through 43, Moses sings a song. He has this poet song to, the, to his people Israel, the people that he's been leading. He climbs up Mount Nebo and he watches Israel pass into the promised land. And then he dies. This is how the Torah ends. It's left with a cliffhanger. Think of it in a cinematic way. Moses standing on this mountain, watching as the people that he's been leading for decades and decades go off to their destiny. What does that destiny look like? As for next week, when we're going to talk about Joshua, we're leaving the Torah and we're going into the historical books starting with Joshua. So until then, this is Chaplain Greg. If you like what you're watching, if you're finding it beneficial, please like and subscribe. Share it with some other folks if you would. And uh, I'll see you next week. Take care and God bless.